Hi guys, welcome to the HL portion of option B. In this video, we're going to start with the topic of genetic algorithms, move on to neural networks, take a look at supervised and unsupervised learning, and finish off with natural language processing and chatbots. Let's get started. Now, basically the way to look at genetic algorithms is to see it through the lens of survival the fittest. Basically, we're gonna use the same methodology as evolution to end up with an optimal solution at the end of using a genetic algorithm. Now, when we actually look at the evolutionary process in terms of genetics, basically we're taking different combinations of genes and we're breathing, we're breathing them together until we end up with the fittest gene. And we can think of a gene as basically a list of different characteristics, right? So a list of different characteristics. Now, in the same way, when we're using genetic, genetic algorithms in the context of machine learning, we're going to have different combinations of certain information. Now, a great, a great example, which we're going to look at here in more depth, would be a travel itinerary. So we might have an itinerary of different uh, places that we're going, and each of these might have either a, a review, or there might be some distance involved, or there might be some character, characteristics involved with each of these. What we're basically going to do is combine this one itinerary with another itinerary, and we're gonna do that for a pool of maybe 100 different itineraries until we end up with the one that best fits some criteria. So basically, when we use genetic algorithms, we have some population of possible successful solutions to a problem. And these solutions are usually represented by some collection of information. We use an iterative process where the fitter solutions are those that better fit some pre-selected criteria, which again, in this case, might be reviews or distance or something like that, um, until we get some optimal solution. And we'll look in more depth as to how this process works. So the first process in genetic algorithms is going to be initialization. So we're going to start by creating a population of individuals, where each individual represents a potential solution to our problem. Now, this may actually be a population of individuals that were already given through data collection or something else, but we're starting with a bunch of possible solutions. These are typically encoded as strings of bits, characters, or numbers, basically a list or collection of information, as you mentioned before. Next, we calculate the fitness of each individual in the population. So you basically look at each string that we have and see how well it fits some preset criteria that we have. And based on how well it fits that criteria, we give it a fitness score. The fitness score show, indicates how good the solution is in solving the problem. Next, we select individuals that we basically want to breed together to contribute to the next generation. If we were to compare this to actual human beings, this would be like eugenics, where we basically take people with the best traits, maybe the ones who are best looking, have the best muscular structure, the most intelligent, and we basically breed them together until we end up with another generation. That same concept applies here. Those with higher fitness scores are going to be selected to produce the next, to produce the next generation. And there are a number of ways that this is done. We don't really need to know these for option B, but just know there's usually some methodology by which we select fit individuals that we're going to combine to produce the next generation. The next step, once you've selected those fit individuals, is to pair selected individuals and create offspring by combining parts of their genetic material. The genetic, the genetic material might be bits, characters, etc., in such a way that we're combining traits of both strings or both, let's say, collections of information to get something that is hopefully better than both of them. This, this basically simulates biological reproduction where we're combining the chromosomes of two individuals to get another one with the hope that we're mixing beneficial traits. Now, if you look at genetic algorithms in from a graphical perspective, uh, A1, A2, A3, and A4 all are, are bits that represent a solution to some problem. As a whole, all of these are a population. That's what's circled in purple. Each one of these solutions can be called a chromosome, and each individual bit in the solution can be called a gene. Basically, we pick some fit individuals, which in this case might be A1 or A2, and we can exchange genes with them by some methodology until they get something entirely different. Now, we don't see the result here, but we would end up with some other possible result. Actually, I guess we do see it right here. So like A5 and A6 is maybe what would be the result. And so by combining them, we would get these, which are possibly better than A1 or A2. That's basically how genetic algorithms work. Now, 
some other aspects of genetic algorithms is basically once we've combined both individuals together, we want to introduce some random changes to add some genetic diversity and possibly get some new solutions that we haven't thought of. That's a process called mutation. This can introduce new potentially beneficial traits. Now, once we've basically, I guess, bred together or we've uh, combined all of the fit individuals, we're going to replace our old population of potential solutions that we started out with with a new offspring. And we're basically going to, con we're basically going to repeat this whole process over and over again uh, um, until we reach some satisfa satisfactory fitness level or a maximum number of generations is reached. Generations being as doing this whole process of selecting fit solutions, combining them, mutating them, checking to see how well they perform, etc. Now, once we get to, this, to the end of to our last generation, we basically pick the best individual from the final population because this is the basically combined efforts of choosing the most fit solutions cycle, like over multiple cycles or multiple generations. So basically repeating in this step right here, repeating all the previous processes to generate new populations over and over again until we reach some arbitrary criteria and then we pick the best solution we have at that point. Now, basically we start with our initial population. We evaluate each, uh, each chromosome or each solution according to some fitness function, which you see right here. Based on which ones are the most fit, we are basically going to put them together, I guess breed them together. Now, I guess this selection is just giving us four, uh, four different chromosomes, and we're just combining them through the process of crossing them over to kind of get new solutions, basically make their kids, and then we add mutations in the end to just add a little bit of diversity to our possible solutions. And that's basically how genetic algorithms work. Initial population, fitness function, based on that, select the most fit uh, chromosomes, which I guess it's not really clear. I, I think these might be the most fit, but I, I imagine all of them are because the reality is we just only want to take the fit chromosomes and, uh, and sort of put them together. So I imagine all of these right here are fit chromosomes. We're combining them, and then we're adding mutations, and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna basically repeat this process over and over again until we reach some number of cycles. This is just basically another uh, diagram that's that's illustrating this process. Population, select the fittest, breed them together. Uh, so basically, combine their different uh, characteristics or their different we could say bits in the case of our previous example. Combine different aspects of their solution together mutate them to add some diversity, and then whatever the result is becomes our new population until we get to the end. Now, what I want to do is I wanted to get go into more depth with this itinerary example that I basically talked about earlier. Now, the first part of this itinerary example is going to be initialization. So we're going to generate an initial set of itineraries for some trip. And each itinerary represents a sequence of cities to visit. Now, what we can do is calculate the fitness of each itinerary based on total travel time and costs. So these are basically the criteria by which we want to evaluate how good an itinerary is. And we choose itineraries for reproduction based on their fitness. High fitness itineraries have a higher chance of being selected, which ensures that good traits are passed on to future generations. So we're going to check some high fitness itineraries and we're going to sort of pair them together. We're going to pair select itineraries and swap, se swap segments of their city sequences to create new itineraries. That was basically this process that we looked at right, looked at right here. We're basically swapping genetic material to get, new, to get new possible solutions. This mimics the mixing of genetic material and can give us maybe more, offense, more efficient routes in terms of total travel time and cost. Next, we have mutation. Um, we're going to introduce some small changes in some itineraries, just swapping two cities' positions. These are more incremental, smaller changes. Next, we're going to replace the less fit itineraries in our initial population with the new ones. So actually, I guess in my initial example, I said we were going to replace the whole population. But, you know, there are different methods. I think probably more likely you would just replace the less fit itineraries so that your generation, you get to keep the fit itineraries, but you get rid of the ones that are sort of duds. And this will gradually improve the process, the overall quality of the itineraries in the population. And then you do this process all over again until a satisfactory itinerary is found according to your criteria or set number of generations is reached, and then choose the best for press performing criteria from the final population. This is going to be the one that's the most efficient. Again, 
according to tr total travel time and costs. And that's basically an, itinerary, an example of genetic algorithms with regards to itinerary. All right, now in order to solidify our understanding of genetic algorithms, let's take a look at an IB example. Following the eruption of a volcano in a mountainous region, isolated groups of endangered animals are, are displaced across a large area. A computer-manned aircraft is used to identify the positions of the groups. The optimum path to the groups is then calculated so that they can re be reached by conservationists. Outline the use of a genetic algorithm to determine this optimum path. So we, we would set up a set of possible paths from point to point. So we are, we'd rather have a set. So we'd have, you know, this is going to be our initial population where we'd have some paths um, to get to the groups. So the idea, I guess, is that we want to basically get to all the different groups. We have multiple isolated groups, and we would have different paths that would allow us to meet this particular goal. And that's going to be our initial population. We're going to measure them against a fitness function. The least suitable are discarded and replaced with those that are suitable, um, replaced by a set created from better paths. So I guess either the least suitable are discarded or we're just replacing the whole set with better paths or with those created from the better path fats, paths as evaluated by the fitness function. Um, then we're going to do some mutation and crossover and repeat this process over and over again until the best solution is found. So I actually think that the important thing to take away from this problem is you need to understand what your set is going to be, right? So it says the optimum path to the groups. So we need to understand that we're going. our initial solution is going to be some possible paths to all the different endangered groups. And once we've done that, once we kind of understand that context, we can kind of just recycle the different processes that we know of in genetic algorithms or in the implementation of genetic algorithms. So that being said, let's move on. Now, what I want to do is summarize genetic algorithms according to the IB exam. So this is taken directly from an IB mark scheme. So what the IB says a genetic algorithm is, is a process where the initial population set is chosen randomly or pseudo-randomly. A fitness function is applied to each population. The fittest members are selected for the next stage, which means basically replacing the initial population. Genetic operators are applied, just crossover and mutation. Crossover being that exchange of bits or parts of a chromosome that we talked about before. Mutation being the sort of exchange of individual uh, bits or individual parts of a solution. And this process is repeated until an acceptable level of fitness is found. You could also say a plateau is reached, meaning it's impossible to generate any new solutions, or we've hit some maximum number of generations or iterations of this entire process right here. So that concludes our last IB example for genetic algorithms. Now let's move on to neural networks, which encompasses a large part of the HL curriculum. Now, basically what neural networks are is they are a simplified version of the human brain. So they're structured in a similar way to how neurons would be in the brain, and they function similarly to how neurons would in terms of being able to take in information as a network and then recognize patterns in it. So they help us in terms of neural networks in the machine learning sense. They allow us to identify categories, predict outcomes, and find patterns in data. And if you think about how our brain does this, we kind of do the same thing, right? Like for example, when we open our eyes and we see something, we're really just recognizing patterns. We're taking in visual input, and then our neurons, our brain, is making sense of it to tell us what we're looking at. Neural networks, again, they do the same thing, except they are, they, they're an algorithm. A neural network is simply a model for an algorithm that basically goes through the same process. Now these networks, neural networks, work by improving their ability to complete some task over time. They learn from examples, much like how we learn from, exper from experience. And the more examples they get, the better they become at their tasks. Now this is an example of a neural network taken from the IB exam. In a neural network, we have something called an input layer. This input layer is generally used to accept input. We have a hidden layer, and then we have an output layer, which basically gives us some output. So basically, let's say for example, we want to try to find, let's say we want to try to find the best student or predict who the best student is, is, is going to be in a data set based on four factors. So those factors might be something like grades, pa like past uh, grade point average, number of advanced subjects they're taking, and age. 
Basically, all four of those factors would go into our input layer. They would go through our hidden layer, which would help make sense of these different factors and look for any patterns that indicate a, a good student. And then we'd get an output of either a one or a zero, maybe, maybe a one indicating a successful student and a zero not indicating a successful student. That's kind of how our neural network works. So to summarize, the input layer accepts data either for training purposes or to make a prediction. Hidden layers are responsible for making decisions and output layers are responsible for the final prediction. Now, in our previous example, we just talked about taking some input, using hidden layers to make decisions, and then getting some output. But in order for neural networks to accurately be able to recognize patterns, we need to train them. So let's take a look at what that looks like through a scenario. Now, to learn what neural networks are, we're going to be looking at a scenario kind of similar to the one that I just outlined, except we're going to be a bit more specific. So we want to use a neural network to predict whether a student will receive admissions to university based on three criteria, GPA, SAT score, the number of AP or IB classes they took out of 10. Now we have three criteria, so we're gonna have three input neurons, or three neurons on this input layer right here. Our result will either be a one or a zero predicting acceptance or a lack of acceptance. So we have two possible results, which means we actually have two output neurons. So actually in our example right here, we just had one output. But in reality, if we have two possible outputs, we would really have one right here and one right here. And this one, this one would light up, for example, if there's a success, this one would give us some result, and this one wouldn't right here. But this actually, this example is just from an IB exam. It wasn't necessarily meant to um, simulate the example that I went through, but this is probably a better description of what that would look like because there are two output neurons. Anyways, the number of results we have would be the number of output neurons we have and the number of input neurons we'd have would be the number of criteria for each entity or each piece of data or each, yeah, basically for each scenario we're going to put through our neural network. Now, again, we'll learn more about these, but keep in mind that we're talking about a network, but really this is all code, right? So we'd have some code to represent input neurons, hidden uh, neurons, and output neurons, and these respective layers. We're not gonna look at this from a code perspective, but just keep in mind, these aren't like physical things. Like it's really just, it's really just code that's kind of representing how we, to input, how we re receive and then process data. So that's our scenario. Now into our neural network, what we would wanna do first is actually train our network. And in order to train our network, we'd wanna put data into it that already has some known output. So this is what our data set would look like in order to train our neural network to be able to recognize successful students. We've got, we've got four different students and each student is represented by a GPA and SAT score, number of AP or IB classes, and whether or not they were admitted. Now, again, we're gonna use these to train our neural network. So we're gonna input new, our, our data into neural network. We're gonna check and see whether the result is what we want. So, for example, if we put all of this data into our neural network for this first student, so that means uh, this data right here, we would want our output layer to give us a one. We would want the new we want a the neuron that represents our output to light up, or that represents a successful student that's been admitted to a university to light up. And that's basically what we expect from the neural network. So when we're training our neural network, we're basically going to be inputting uh, that data. And we're going to expect, for example, this neuron right here to light up. Although this is a very different example, but we're gonna expect a certain result. And if we don't get the result, we're going to adjust the weights of the connections between our neurons until our neural network gives the correct result based on input data. So what does that mean? Basically right here, we're going to be putting in three criteria, right? So as we said, in our, different, in our example, we're gonna have a GPA, SAT score, and number of IB or AP classes. And this is gonna be success, and this is gonna be not success. So in an ideal world, we would want this to have a zero and a, and a one for this first row of data right here that we circled and marked in red. Now, if that's not the case, what we need to do is we need to make adjustments to our network. Now, what you do need to know is that Right here, we have our input layer and our hidden layer. And our input layer is connected to something called a hidden layer. These are all neurons that will hold some value and output some value. And each one of these arrows right here represents a connection between 
each neuron in the input layer and each neuron in the hidden layer. So if you look at just this first neuron right here, we'll just label this neuron one, we'll call it one, two, and three. So if you just look at our first layer right here, we have a connection to hidden layer one. Actually, I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna number this as well, one, two, three, four. So we have a connection to hidden layer one, hidden layer two, hidden layer three, and hidden layer four, right down here. Now, when we put our value for the GPA uh, into, when we submit it to our input neuron, it's going to send a, well, it's gonna send a value to each of the hidden neurons. But also, each, each connection between, the, between each input neuron and hidden neuron is represented by a weight. So that weight can be a variety of things, but it's usually represented by a number. So it might be like 2.3, uh, 2.5, like 3.1, 5.2, Now, basically whatever value we put into the input neuron, it's gonna get processed and it's gonna be multiplied by this weight and the result is going to arrive at our neuron right here. And basically that neuron is then going to take in other values from two, three, and four, and it's gonna send its own value to, an out, to, to the output. So we're basically sending values to all these hidden neurons, and then they're sending, they're processing them and then sending their own values to the output. And when we wanna adjust the network, we're going to be changing these weights so that we get our ultimate result. Now it might be really complicated, this is just a brief introduction, but let's go further and see what that really means. Now, before we get into like more of the mathematical aspect of how these weights work, let's take a more high, like high level look at the entire training process. So how does training work? So first, obviously we're gonna feed data into the network. So we're gonna take in data through the input layer. And we kind of already talked about how that is. Each criteria or each, um, I would say data, data point, or each type of data for each record is going to have its own neuron. Next, we're gonna make predictions. So data is gonna go from the input through to the hidden layer and then to the output layer where the network is gonna make its initial prediction. Now, after making a prediction, the network checks it against the correct answer, which we already know from the training data. And in our example right here, this would be the correct answer in the admitted column. Now, once we've done that, we're going to go ahead and calculate the error between our predicted and correct answer. So that's gonna be the mathematical difference between both of those because the output of the neural network right here is going to represent some mathematical value. Now, if one would indicate success right here and zero mean it's not a, is not a success, we're really never going to have a value that's gonna be one or zero exactly. We might have like 0.99 here and, 0, and 0 0.03 right here or something like that. So we're gonna have some mathematical value that's probably not gonna be a whole number and we're gonna calculate the difference between what we got out of the neural network, what mathematical value we got, and what we want. And that difference is gonna be calculated using a cost function. And that's a number two, or that's a term to remember. The cost function measures how wrong the network's predictions are, and the ultimate goal is to make that error as, as small as possible. So we basically want to get as close to the answer we're supposed to get as possible. Now next, we're gonna use this error to teach our network how to work, how to appropriately give us the correct answer. And we're gonna do that through a process called backpropagation. Now back backpropagation is basically the network reflecting on its errors and figuring out how to adjust its neurons calculations. And that means we're gonna change the settings or weights inside the network. And again, those weights are mathematical values that correspond to the connection between the input and the hidden neurons. And this weight acts as sort of a multiplier for whatever comes out of the input neurons and whatever is, and we can also have that same thing passed on from the hidden layers to the output. But anyways, in between every layer of, of neurons and between every neuron and, the, and a neuron in the subsequent layer, there's gonna be weights that are basically multipliers for the output of the neuron. And that's what we're gonna adjust in order to ultimately get the output that we want. That's what backpropagation does. It makes adjustments to those layers. Now, once we've done, now once we've trained a, a neural network using uh, using one set of data. So once we've trained it, for example, based on just this row of data right here, 
We're going to repeat that process for every single piece of data, which is probably going to be more than just four, uh, four pieces of data, just four records of data. This is just an example. So we're going to repeat that process, inputting data, making predictions, calculating errors, and adjusting using backpropagation as many times as necessary. And each cycle through the data is called an epoch. I don't, I'm probably not saying that right, but whatever, we'll just roll with it. And every time we do train uh, the neural network, we do conduct backpropagation, the network gets better at, at its task. The network's performance is evaluated to see if it's improving and accurately recognizing, for example, cats in different images or students that will get admitted to, uh, to good universities. Now, I've given you more of an overview of how neural networks work from a perhaps higher level of perspective. We talked a little bit about inputs into the neural network and potential outputs, but I want to use an IB example here with some actual numbers to really illustrate how this whole process works. Now, if we look at this example right here, we have some input values, and these are 0.1 and 0.5. Now, in our previous example, we didn't really talk so much about what those input values would be. We had like GPA, we had number of AP and IB score, uh, great, uh, scores, or classes being taken, and you know different inputs, different criteria like that. Ultimately, those are all going to represent some mathematical value that will be the input into our neural network. Now, these circled in red right here represent weights. And these weights exist between not only our uh, input layer right here, not only between our input and hidden layers right here, rather, but also between our hidden layers and our output layer. So basically how this works is each of these neurons so the input of each of these neurons right here is going to be multiplied by a weight and sent to a neuron in the hidden layer. So if we just focus on neuron 1 in the hidden layer, um, what we're going to do is our first input is going to be the value of A multiplied by our weight between A and hidden and hidden layer or hidden neuron 1, which is 0.5. So it's going to be A times 0.5. And what we do is we add that to the input from the other uh, input neurons. So we're going to add that to the value of B times the weight from B to hidden neuron 1, which is 0.5 right here. So B times 0.5. So that mathematical expression is going to be calculated in our hidden layer, or at our hidden layer. Which again, it's really just going to be a, a calculation that's going to take place in some code that represents the hidden layer, or the hidden that specific neuron. Now, a is 0.1 and b is 0.5. So ultimately, we're just going to do 0.1 times 0.5, um, which is just going to give us 0 0.05. And we're going to do 0 0.5, which is b times 0 0.5, which is going to give us 0 0.25. And if we add those up, we're just going to get 0.3. Now, we basically multiplied our input signal, which is right here, by our weight. But oftentimes, in order to get a more accurate calculation, we add another value called a bias. And this bias can be pretty much anything. Just as an example, we might add 0.2 right here. And that adjusts our value at our hidden neuron. Again, this, this, is, often a, this is often done just to, allow, just to give us maybe more, um, more fine-tuned precision in terms of adjusting the network. So this is called our bias, and the bias is the value we add to the value to the value you've gotten from all of our um, input neurons or all of our neurons in the previous layer. So this is going to give us a total value of 0.5, and what we would then do is we put that 0.5 through what's called an activation function. So that means we're going to apply some mathematical function, which can either be a sigmoid function, which gives us a value between zero and one or a ReLU function, which makes sure we have a positive value. And we get another, we get another uh, mathematical value, or not, we get another value. So once it goes into the activation function, then we might get 0.7. And then if we get 0.7 right here, and I'm just going to actually make that yellow, if you get 0.7 right here, then we would multiply that by 0.1, we multiply that by 0.1, and, and that same process again is going to happen at our output neuron. And that's going to happen right here as well. And all of that, so basically the same thing we had at hidden neuron one would be happening at hidden neuron two for its respective weights, and all of that's going to go over here. 
And again, this the process that happened at hidden neuron one and two is gonna be happening at the output neuron as well, right here. Output neuron one, we'll say. And that's basically what happens when a value goes through the network. Now, if we talk about training in general and backpropagation, what's gonna happen is right here, we're gonna get some output value. And we're gonna apply something called a cost function. So let's say that that output value is 0.7, but the value we really want is one. Our cost function is going to address the difference between both of those values. So it'll be, it's not just gonna be one minus 0.7, but there's some other mathematical magic that happens. And based on that cost function, we're going to conduct back propagation. And that back propagation is gonna be changing all of these weights right here and biases. Now there are different biases at each at each neuron, there can be, so we'd be adjusting those as well. But through back propagation, we're going to adjust all of those so that next time, instead of getting 0.7, maybe we get 0.9. Now, that back propagation is only gonna happen in training data. So it's only gonna happen in the training process, which means we're putting an input where we actually know what the output is and we're making adjustments accordingly. This is so that when we, when we put in input, when we just put in any input for which we don't know what the output is, we can make an accurate prediction. Anyways, that being said, let's go back and let's look at some terminology for training now that we've actually just gone through all of this. Now the main term terminology to know for training is weights, biases, and activation functions. Weights are parameters that adjust the strength of the input signals. So the input signals were, were these right here, and we're using these weights to adjust their strength. The biases we already talked about, were, they're added to the weighted input that shifts, it shifts their value so that the activation function gives us something different. So it allows the neural network to better fit complex patterns. It acts like an intercept in a linear equation, providing flexibility in neurons out in a neuron's output. And if you think about the intercept, if we're moving that intercept, then we're just kind of shifting the whole graph over. And that's the role of the bias. The activation function, so it says it's added to the weighted input. So actually right here, it looks like I accidentally just copied what was right here for the bias. But the activation function has two possibilities, and it's basically changing the output. It's giving us a different output for the weight, the value that we've gotten from the weight and the bias. And again, we have, there are two activation functions that you really need to know, which are sigmoid and, and relu. But there are actually a variety, there are many, many more activation functions, but these are the ones that are relevant. And again, I'll change this to actually reflect the reality of what an activation function is, but we've already kind of gone, gone over that concept. Now again, we have our cost function, which is the difference between the neural networks predictions, so that mathematical value that's gonna be output by the output neuron and the actual target data. And the idea is to minimize the output of this cost function. Now our cost function is not simply uh, subtracting our, um, our desired value from our input, from like the actual output received, but we might have more than one output neuron. So it's gonna be the sum of those. And there might be some other mathematical magic that's done to them. But as we're conducting back propagation, and we're adjusting our weights and biases, we're basically minimizing this cost function. Because we're trying to minimize this cost function, we need to learn, I mean, that minimization process is leading us to our gradient descent function. So the gradient, def defense, uh, the gradient descent function is a function that, it's basically an optimization method that, allow, that tells us how to change the weights in our neural network to minimize errors. So based on our cost function, it identifies the optimal adjustments to weights and biases to tell us how much to change those weights and biases by. The cost function guides, it informs this gradient descent function. And it's really a derivative of the cost function, giving us the rate of change of error, or we're using the derivative of the cost function. Now, this term derivative comes from calculus. If you don't understand it, like it doesn't matter, but um, what you need to know is the gradient is the cost function tells us that the differences between our desired output and the output we actually got, and our gradient descent function basically gives us a vector that tells us how much to change the weights and the biases in our neural network so that we get the output that we want. Now, here's just like another example of an individual neuron functioning. We have some outputs. Uh, we're predicting an output and sending it to our output neuron, cost function, etc. Now, what's important to know is that COTS function is also called a fitness function, and it's referred to as a fitness function quite often on the IB exam. Now, here's just like a quick 
sort of output or just quick overview of what um, things might look like. Um, here we have input, we have a hidden layer, and that's going to, we have like four neurons in our hidden layer, and that's going to our output layer. And maybe we're trying to predict whether the answer is A, B, C, or D. That's like our task. And we're training it at this moment. So we get different percentages for each possible output, but 100% for output D, which means this is the winner. Now, what I want to kind of talk about before we move on to some performance factors for neural networks is having more than one hidden layer and just kind of talking about how neural networks actually are able to make predictions and kind of give us a result that we want. So right here, we have an input layer and there's only three neurons, but the idea is that we are trying to input um, a picture of a cat. Now, a picture of a cat might have like, you know, maybe a, a good couple of thousand pixels. So really, we would, what we would probably do is we would have, we would group those and we'd have multiple layers with each layer representing, let's say, 20 pixels. And this would probably be enough to represent one color, right? So we would actually maybe have like a, a couple of hundred, let's say 300 input neurons or something like that. But basically what we're doing is we're taking in, like when we take in a, a certain input in each input neuron, each one of these hidden neurons represent, each one of the, yeah, each one of these hidden neurons represent a certain combination of inputs. So for this cat, it might be that each one of these, one neuron represents um, a certain number of pixels, a certain number of pixels uh, in a certain configuration that represents the leg of a cat. One might be something that represents like the, the mouth of the cat or another part of the cat. In terms of actually talking about students, if you apply this to students where we have three inputs, one hidden layer might represent a certain combination where students have a high number of AP classes but a low GPA and a, uh, yeah, a, like another low SAT score. So one neuron might represent a high SAT score and a low GPA, but a high number of SAT classes. And then another further neuron that takes input from both of those neurons might represent an even more complex uh, example. With the cat, now we're starting to put together not only a, uh, not only a leg right here and possibly a, um, a mouth right here. Oh, that's weird. A mouth right here. And then a, let's say, eyes right here into an example but then we're putting we're taking we're getting a combination of those and then further layers might get another combination so as we go up to different layers we're getting more and more complex combinations that we can ultimately that can ultimately tell us what we want to know so it can ultimately really just allow us to make a prediction right so if we have we might have like one possible combination right here and that aligns with and that one factor right here and one factor right here come together to give us a more unique combination to light those up. Ultimately, that might tell us something, that might tell us some result. So therefore, actually like one of the big performance factors in neural networks can be more hidden layers because each, each hidden neuron lighting up represents a certain combination of factors in our input and subsequent hidden layers allow us to take those factors and then combine them and give us even more or even more complex or even more specific circumstances that can ultimately lead us to the output we want. So increasing the number of layers and then increasing the number of input neurons as well um, can allow us to improve the performance of the neural network because the more inputs we have, the more criteria we have to make a prediction. Um, right here we have machine learning and deep learning. So they're both basically the same process with using neural networks, but deep learning just represents more hidden layers, which again is allowing us to analyze more like sort of complex situations. Now again when we have a neural network when we have a neural network like this, like usually based on the activation function we might have like a one or zero. So the hidden layer is kind of like lighting up that it detects something. It's lighting up that it's giving us a mathematical signal that for example something in the picture of a cat like a leg or an eye has been detected or some combination of inputs has been detected in data representing students. And that lights up and then it sends it on. It could send it on to another hidden layer. And that means that the combination of a certain number of neurons lighting up gets, it, gets sent to that layer. And we're, pro we're progressively able to detect more and more complex situations 
or more and more complex combinations of pixels or data in a data set that can ultimately lead us to whether we have a cat or whether we have a successful student or not. Now let's take a look at an IB example that, that takes a neural network with more neurons and more layers into account. So right here it says the following block diagram illustrates a neural network used by a supervised learning algorithm to calculate a resulting value res. The neural network in the block diagram contains 60 nodes in the input layer, uh, I, uh, 36 nodes in the hidden layer, H, and six nodes in the outermost layer. So this is really just uh, another hidden layer. We can say hidden layer two. Uh, and all the nodes in one layer are feeding into all the nodes in the success in the successive layer. In particular, the value res is calculated by using all the nodes in O. Now, ultimately, if we have an output right here, I think we do have one. I mean, I think this is just the output. So if that's res is our output, that's probably an output neuron, and this is therefore our output layer, which just consists of one neuron. So calculate the number of weights that the above neural network uses in producing a value for res. So if this is really just an output neuron and an output layer, we can say that between 60 and 36, remember that if we have an input neuron, that means that every single neuron is sending a signal to every single neuron in layer H. That means each neuron in H is going to have 60 weights connected to it, 60 weights from the input neuron. And that if there are 36 neurons in H, that means we're gonna have 60 times 36 weights because every single neuron in the hidden layer is, is receiving a signal and has a weight connected to every single neuron in I. Now, subsequently between H and O, every single neuron in O has a weight that's connected to every single neuron in H. So we're gonna have 36 weights from H times six weights in O. And then if we see res as just being an output layer or an out one neuron right there, that means that we're gonna have six times one weights. And so the sum of all of these is gonna be six times 36 uh, plus 36 times six plus six times one. And I guess that's 2,382. I don't think we actually needed to like write that out, but if we have this expression, that's enough. Now, next, let's take a look at it. Let's take a, take a question. Take a look at a question that is more, I guess, theoretical. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that we talked about just neural networks, but this refers to neural networks, artificial neural, neural networks, and those are basically the same thing. So, explain one reason why A and Ns are suitable for solving the types of problems solved in pattern recognition, game playing, classification, and data mining. Now the answer is that the mathematical relationships in these, these types of problems um, are the reason why. And uh, like, so I think the main thing is that like, the relationships are impossible to, to define. So if we think about things like uh, classification or pattern recognition, oftentimes we don't really have a clear like function we don't have a function that can exactly give us the output for an input. So uh, even if you think about like real life scenarios or people playing a game or something like that, for every input they have, we're not always gonna have an exact output. Now, as a result, when we don't have, when we have like more of a real world scenario, we don't have predictable output. Instead, we need to be able to make predictions based on what we've seen in the past. And so if we just want to be able to learn and make predictions uh, from real world data, from past data, that's where neural networks can really come into play. When we don't have a direct mathematical relationship between input and output, sometimes we have outliers, sometimes we have things that happen differently, then we can use neural networks to just like learn the pattern, maybe compensating for those outliers that throw things off, compensating for that lack of direct relationship between the X and Y. Now next, an A and N is being trained to recognize handwritten numbers by identifying them as a digit from zero to N. Describe an appropriate set of data that could be used to train the network. Assume that each digit to be identified is made up is an, is an image of, or made up of 30 by 30 pixels. Now an appropriate uh, input would be many sets of data. So you basically want a picture of each number, right? So right here, we want to train, we want to recognize handwritten numbers which are gonna be somewhere from zero to nine. So you basically want an artificial neural network to have pictures 
of a bunch of, of each number, like a bunch of different examples of each number. So maybe 10 of zero, 10 of one, 10 of two. So it gets an idea of how those are written in different ways. It can kind of see like different patterns that correspond to the same number. Now it says, I assume that each digit to be identified is input as an image made up of 30 by 30 pixels. So state the number of neurons that would be in the input layer and the output layer. So the input layer would be 900, because in this case, we want to take in every single pixel. And we're going to put together different combinations in our hidden, in our, using our hidden layers to be able to get an output. And we're going to have 10 output neurons because we have 10 possible outputs from 0 to 9. Now, last question, a simplified version of an A and N is shown below. Explain the way in which the output from neuron D will be determined. So you've got some inputs right here. We have a hidden layer right here, and we have an output layer right here. And this is neuron D. So it's going to be the product of the weights and the input values that are summed from A, B, and C. Um, so we're going to have weights. So we're going to have input signals from A, B, and C that are going to be multiplied by weights going to D. It's specifically going to be like these right here, these right, this one right here, and this one right here. Um, we're going to add or subtract a bias. And this will be compared to, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be compared to. But um, once, we add, once we add or subtract a bias, a function will be applied, which is our activation function. Next, the network is set up with initial values. The outputs are compared with the desired outputs. Identify the steps that now take place to train the network. And our answer to this question is going to function as kind of a summary of everything we've gone over so far with regards to training. So we're going to check the difference between the actual and desired outputs. Um, and we're going to analyze those using the cost function. This is going to lead us to adjust the weights of the neurons and the hidden layers. We're going to, and we're going to repeat that process until the cost function reaches an acceptable value, some acceptable value of error, or until a certain number of iterations are made. This one I think is probably less true than this one right here, but either one is probably fine. Okay, so the last topic I want to address is sort of the intersection between genetic algorithms and neural networks. So there are two approaches to combining genetic algorithms and neural networks that we're going to look at, and they're kind of similar but not exactly the same. So in general, for both these approaches, genetic algorithms are going to be used to optimize weights. So basically, we're going to start with the po well. In this example, we're going to start with the population of neural networks with randomly assigned weights. Although we could also just have a single neural network and then apply apply randomly assigned weights to them, and see what happens. So we could rather just have a population of randomly assigned weights, with each weight in a particular, uh, let's say, chromosome, applying to a different link between uh, uh, between a, each layer between a layer in a neuron or between a layer in the neural network. So for example, if we have a like input layer and then we have a hidden layer, then we'd have one link between them and that would represent one gene in a chromosome of genetic algorithms. And these would all be randomly assigned uh, to create a chromosome of which there'd be many of these that would make up our initial population. So then using each of these lists of weights um, or I guess even separate neural networks. In this case, it's like we have multiple neural networks. We would assess each network's performance using a predefined fitness function um, or a cost function. And then we'd select the best performing networks according to the fitness function. Or we would just select the weights that perform the best um, from our initial population. And then what we could do is combine and modify the, the weight, modify the weights to create a new generation of networks or just to create a new generation of weights simulating the process of natural evolution. And then we just keep doing that until we, read, until we reach some level of fitness or we go through a certain number of iterations. So again, really what we're doing is we're optimizing weights and we're gonna be changing these weights until we get a set of weights for our neural network that gives us the, basically that gives us the best result. And I, like, again, I just wanna emphasize that this, this is a population of neural networks, like we have different neural networks. And this is a possibility as well, we could have neural networks of different structure and different weights, and we could just have an initial population of these, and then we choose the neural network and weights that are the best. So it could either be neural networks and weights, or we could just be optimizing for weights in a, like, in a specific type of neural network um, with a certain number of neurons. Now, here's an example question that makes use of this concept. Uh, an optical character recognition. 
Optical character recognition is basically recognizing text from images, so recognizing individual letters or numbers from an image. A genetic algorithm can be used to determine and refine the structure of a neural network. Explain how a genetic algorithm could be used to determine appropriate weights for the, for the optical character recognition neural network. So again, right here, a genetic algorithm may not necessarily be used just for weights, but also to optimize the structure of the network. So it could be the number of neurons in the hidden layer, um, it could be the number of hidden layers there are, or different aspects of the neural network. But again, this question B is focusing on weights. So basically what we could do if we wanted to optimize weights is very similar to our previous example. So a random set of weights is populated for the network, our initial population. Uh, each is run with a training set of letters. So we take some training data set and we put it through the neural network with a, with a set of weights fitness function decided in advance, fitness evaluated against fitness function for the network. So we see like what the actual fitness is. A crossover, crossover and or mutation on the algorithm and parameters using a set of best solutions. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, um, we're going to go through our this a set of weights, which is in our initial population. And then for each set of weights, we're gonna put some letters through it. And then we're gonna figure out what provides the best result and then use crossover or mutation to uh, change those and potentially create a better set or a better set of weights. And then we're just gonna repeat this process until we get acceptable recognition of individual characters. So to summarize right here, we've just got a list, we've got chromosomes of different combinations of weights. We're just going to apply those to your neural network and put training data through it. Um, and we're gonna pick the ones performed the best, cross, over and cross those over and mutate them until we end up with some like list of weights for a neural network that is the best, it provides the best result. Not too different from our first example, but I just thought it was worth going through it from an IV context. So now that we have a somewhat decent understanding of how neural networks work, let's move on to how they can be applied. So there are three use cases we're gonna be focusing on, uh, image recognition, optical character recognition, and predictive text. And these are all applications you're gonna to have to understand with some depth for the IB exam. <clears throat> well, the first is, well, image and optical character recognition sort of go together, but when we're referring to these concepts, we're broadly talking about the use of neural networks to recognize and make sense of images. And one of the most common use cases is analyzing handwriting and turning it into some actual digital text. If you've used this function on ChatGPT, then you know that you can just literally upload a picture and then extract the, extract the text from it. And that's being done by these types of neural networks that we've learned about. So there are a couple of steps that go into allowing us to do op optical character recognition um, with the use of neural networks. Now, again, optical character recognition is, character recognition is actually just focusing on recognizing characters like these, and image recognition as a whole is focusing on recognizing any images. So for example, being able to pick out something suspicious in a security camera, or even just taking images and recognizing what's in them. Anyways, if we specifically want to talk about how we could recognize handwriting, which is a very prominent use case that is on option B, then what we need to do first is we need to prepare some data to train our, our neural network to recognize handwriting. We kind of talked about this in the previous section, but we're going to go through it again with a little bit more depth. So we need to first assemble a diverse data set of handwritten characters. So we basically want a bunch of images of each character we're seeking to analyze. And we want images of each character, ideally written by different people, so that we can train our neural network to recognize the same number, but written in different styles. Now, next, we want to make sure that these are labeled. So for example, we want, we want to make sure that this image of two written is labeled with a two. So any of these images we have of different handwritten characters, we want them to have a digital label to say what exactly they are, so that when we're training our neural network, we can actually, we actually have something to compare output against. So we can go through the whole cost function and back, back propagation uh, deal. This forms the basis for, and well, that actually this process is also called, is called supervised learning where we're actually training um, a neural network, we're training an algorithm based on a, known in, on a known output. Now, next, what we need to do is some pre-processing. So we need to take those images that we've labeled and we need to process them so that they can be fed into a neural network. 
So the first thing we want to do is make them all the same size because particularly when we're working with images, we're going to be taking each pixel or we're, taking, we're going to be taking a specific number of groups of pixels and feeding them into a neural network. So, and that neural network has a fixed number of input neurons. So for every image, we're going to want to have the same number of inputs into our network. We'll probably also turn it into grayscale, so just black and white to simplify processing. Because if we're just talking about analyzing characters, it doesn't really matter what color they are, right? Next, we're going to break each image down into smaller manageable parts or apply a small filter to, sec to sections of the image. And this is basically what we're going to do. I mean, we could actually break an image down into just its, its pixels, but that may just be too many inputs for a neural network. So instead, we're going to kind of take certain sections. We're going to take basically the whole thing and group it into um, a fixed into parts of a fixed size. And this is called segmentation. This also allows us to focus on local features, so features in, a, um, in an image, rather than just individual pixels. So for example, if you have something like this, if we have a group of, if we're breaking this down, this down into groups of pixels, and this is like one of our groups, then we'll see this specific feature where the seven line crosses this horizontal line, and we can take that into consideration rather than just simply having to analyze each and every individual pixel, pix, or pixel and put them together um, until we detect a pattern that resembles a seven. Now next, we need to set up our network architecture. So basically how our neural network is going to be configured. And one thing you should know is that there are a lot of different types of neural networks and the structure of neural networks can vary widely. So they, the number of neurons they have, the number of layers they have, or the number of neurons in each layer, and even what goes on in between specific uh, layers, it's all subject to change depending on the nature of the neural network. So the first thing we look at is this basic layer configuration. So specifically when working with, uh, with neural networks and object character recognition, we want to configure the, the network with convolutional layers. And convolutional layers will apply filters to an image with the intention of detecting specific features like strokes or curves. We'll get a little bit more into what con convolution is in a later slide, but that's something we want to do. We might also want to include ReLU layers, or I guess RELU layers. And if you remember what RELU is, that was actually an activation function that we uh, used with, with hidden layers specifically to turn whatever input we had into something else. And what ReLU layers are is allows us to introduce something called nonlinearity and eliminate any negative values. So eliminating negative values allows us to simplify our network's calculations. So basically that process of like adding, adding up the weights, multiplying them together, whatever, and you know, adding the bias, that's simpler if we're not dealing with negative values. And also introducing non-linearity allows, this can often allow like certain features that are detected or certain pattern, patterns that are detected to maybe have more of an impact on our prediction than others. So it basically allows us to sort of emphasize emphasize certain features and emphasize certain aspects, which can lean us toward getting a more accurate prediction. Versus, you know, if everything is linear, then basically every type of pattern has the same, well, has the same probability of succeeding. I mean, that's a simple, that's an overly simple way to describe it. But basically nonlinearity -linear allows us to make predictions with a little bit more um, detail or a little bit more specificity. Next, you might also have something called pooling layers. And this reduces the dimensionality of the layers. Um, this basically may, or the dimensionality of the data, which actually basically makes them simpler. Like an example would just be like taking a small two to three pixel, Im pixel image and just kind of putting it all together and maybe reducing some of the definition. But again, both convolutional layers and pooling layers, this is just like an introduction. We're going to look at some slides that focus specifically on these concepts. Speaking of which, next. So, to get more into depth in pooling layers. Pooling layers, they're often layers that are like in between layers of neurons, and they function by reducing the dimensions of the data they process. So basically what they would do is, like if you had a certain group of pixels in an image, the best way to describe it is they're, they're going to summarize the features in the input data. And they're going to make it so that that data can be represented using less, or that basically that image or that information can be represented using less data. So for example, if we had a pooling layer right here, so let's say that we want to take this and we want to 
you want to put it through a pooling layer. So we're taking this and we're turning it into this right here. And if you notice in, in our result, we have, so let's just look at this first square first. We have 12, 7, uh, 13, and 14. Now, basically what it's doing is it's creating a summary of the different features right here by taking one number from each of the four, uh, from each of the four sections. Similarly, right here, we have nine, five, seven, uh, and eight. Now, I guess we have, okay, five from here. I don't really know why there's a seven right there. It could be like an average or something like that. This could be something that's more mathematical. Oh yeah, it is average pooling. So maybe right here, we're actually just average, taking an average of all the values here, all the values here, all the values here, and all the values here. So these are actually, this is max pooling. So this was just taking the maximums and this was just taking the averages. I guess what I was talking about before was like sample pooling, which is just taking a random sample, but this would be better. So if you have max pooling and we're getting the max in each section, that is some way of summarizing the data. An average is probably an even better way. Now with images, they may be like kind of making them like kind of depixelated. So basically not having as much detail. Um, and that's going to be slightly more complex than right here, where we're just trying to summarize the numbers uh, in this grid, in this particular grid. But pooling layers basically makes our data; it reduces the definition in our data, but it also um, decreases its size, which ultimately decreases the computational load. And this can be really important when we're processing a bunch of image files or video files or something that takes up a lot of data. Uh, here's an example of pooling with regards to images. This is our original image. And particularly if you just want to like recognize, for example, I don't know if you want to recognize a building or you want to recognize something that doesn't require a lot of definition, we don't necessarily need a very like high pixel density original image. So we might just use average pooling to turn to this, um, or we might like this might average pooling might be an intermediate state to max pooling or, or we might just go to max pooling. But anyways, these are examples of how pooling would have an impact on our original input. Um, when we have pooling layers. Now next, let's take a look at convolution. So basically convolution is a mathematical operation and it what it basically involves is taking a matrix of values, which is also called a filter, and moving it across an image to analyze specific areas. So for example, let's say that we have an image that looks like this, okay? Um, and in this image is drawn like, I don't know, let's say a circle. So what so if we think about this in computational terms, uh, each one of these squares would be a, could be a pixel, and those would each have their own mathematical value. Now, when we use convolution, the idea is that we would take a matrix, and that matrix might have a value that corresponds to each of these pixels. So you might have like one, uh, we might have like okay, negative one, one, two, um, 1, 3, 1, 1, 4, 1, and 1, 5, 2. And we're going to take each one of these values in, the, in this matrix. We're going to multiply it by a corresponding pixel in our image. And this is going to give us some numerical result. Now, I just kind of randomly generated these values right here, but these values be arranged in such a way that would probably allow, it, that would probably allow us to more easily de detect a circle or emphasize a circle. So using convolution, maybe um, maybe we'd have like this area right here, or this, or this pixel right here, this pixel right here, this pixel right here. So maybe we'd have those pixels after being multiplied by this matrix, resulting in a higher value because we want to emphasize those. So the way convolution works is as the kernel or this matrix slides over the image, multiplies its values with the pixel values that overlap with it. The results are then summed up to produce a single output value representing that part of the image. So one, one thing that might happen is if this is our input image, and this is like a really, really simplistic kernel or matrix. So if we did that, the idea, obviously this matrix would be much bigger um, or be applying it to different parts of the, of the image. But the idea is that if we did that, we'd end up with something like this with our resulting feature map containing mainly the boundaries that we're really interested in. So it's kind of going to get rid of all of the coloring, like, you know, the color of this animal and just kind of give us the outline, which is really all we need to detect what kind of animal it is. We don't really care that much about color, especially in this kind of case. 
So we use convolution for a variety of reasons. One is feature detection. So we can this allows us to more easily detect important features like the shape of letters and numbers or text. Um, and it just makes it more, well, we'll get to that. But basically like if we can, if we only have to, if we can use convolution and then we only have to analyze a feature map to see whether it, uh, it is a letter or a number or whatever, this is a lot more efficient because this right here, this feature map takes up a lot less space in memory than this image does. And it's also, I mean, if it takes up less space, if it, if it um, consists of less data, it's also faster to analyze. So the neural network as a whole is faster and less computation, computationally expensive to run. Also, if, if you focus on features rather than the whole image, then even if we have like different variations in size, orientation, and distortion of edges or text or whatever, we can still recognize the text effectively, even if the image quality is not perfect, partly because it's kind of filtering out any of the unneeded details. Now, the way that we apply convolution is we will fit a convolution layer in between other hidden layers. So it could consist of a layer of quote unquote neurons. These aren't really neurons, but they are just something that fits. So if, we, if we're thinking about neurons with a weight, so if this is like the input and this is like an, uh, a hidden layer neuron, and we have some signal which with like a weight being sent from the input to the hidden uh, neuron. What we might do is you might filter that signal or a group of signals rather to a convolution layer. And that's the role that it plays. It's not actually, it's on, it, like it's not gonna be a layer of neurons, but it's gonna be a layer whose specific function is to perform convolution on some image data that's been input. Now here's an example of what a neural network might look like with a bunch of these different layers in it. So we have our input image, and actually that's going into a convolution layer first, which actually, to be honest, that probably makes a lot more sense than having it in between. Well, I guess that's exactly what this is, right? We have some input and that's going into a convolution layer or from there a hidden layer. And then from the convolution layer, we're going into a relu layer. And this may or may not be part of a hidden layer, actually probably not in this case. Um, so it just means our data is just going to go through uh, an activation function without like the biases or anything like that. Then we might go into a pooling layer, which we talked a pooling layer, which we talked about earlier, and then we might actually end up going through some hidden layers. Or in this case, it's just like one hidden layer, and then I think this is probably this is probably an output layer right here, but it's not so clear. Okay, so now that we've talked about these different layers that are a part of network architecture, and we've just generally talked about what a neural network looks like in the context of optical character recognition or image recognition, let's talk about how training takes place in this context. So right here, um, basically what we're gonna do first is we're gonna send the images through the network. And before, like we just kind of talked about, okay, we're gonna put some input in, it's gonna pass through the layers and get to the output. Now the actual term for just data going through a network is feed is the feed forward process. And in this application, the feed forward process would consist of a convolution layer, a relu layer, or activation layer, and pooling operations. But the rest is going to be the same. So it's going to go through these three layers right here, go through the uh, go through a hidden layer, or some number of hidden layers, and then be output. And then we're going to conduct the whole back propagation uh, process which is going to involve not, not making changes to these layers, but to the hidden layers and the weights between the hidden layers. So that's also going to be weights going from, so for example, if we're talking about an input neuron being here, then our result, we're going to have some weights probably going from here to our hidden layer. And that's going to be the end result of going through all of this and then being multiplied by some weight. So we're still going to have input neurons, and this would be, this would be in the middle so these three layers would be in between our input and output neurons, but or our hidden layer neurons, but we would still have a weight being multiplied by whatever comes out right here. Anyways, once we get an output, we're going to use backpropagation, and that's gonna be used, that's gonna change the weights and the biases, similar to how it was in the, the more basic neural networks we talked about in the previous section, with the goal being to minimize the error between predicted and actual labels. So overall, getting our neural network to give us an accurate result. So now that we've clarified the training process, let's move on to 
some other aspects of the object, optical character recognition process or image recognition process, process. One of those is feature matching. We've kind of already talked about this, so this is gonna be pretty quick. But the first thing we need to talk about is pixel matching. And what I'm gonna say is that this is basically another name for convolution. So we're basically gonna, we're going to take, a, so we're basically gonna take a filter, we're gonna take a kernel, and we're gonna match each image pixel by the corresponding pixel or the corresponding value in a matrix for that particular pixel, sum them up and divide them by the number of pixels. So it's very similar to convolution, but there's some additional mathematics that is a little bit different. And the idea is that a perfect match, uh, so if we are able to detect a particular edge or feature that we're looking for, we would get a one. So this is actually very similar to convolution, but there's just a little bit of additional math that goes into it, including normalization, a few other things. And to kind of piggyback off that, we're gonna be applying continuous convolution across an image in order to ensure that all features are captured and compared against known patterns. This is particularly important um, if we are talking about something like video. We have a bunch of different images and we need to continually be, uh, be conducting convolution on each frame in order to make sure they've captured any necessary patterns. So just take, so feature matching in general, if you understand convolution, then you pretty much understand what's, understand what's going on there. Now, another aspect of optical character recognition is just the actual recognition learning process. Now, we understand the recognition process with regards to supervised learning because that's just neural networks. And this is the whole idea of, con of continually adjusting the network and the training process until we get something that outputs what we want and kind of training our net neural network on data for which we know what the output or what the result should be. We have another method though, which is called unsupervised learning. And this involves a neural network, just being able to take an image or take some group, some data set, and then just detect patterns and detect specific features in it without knowing what they are. So that's unsupervised learning. And there, there's no real training that's done. We just have an algorithm that acts more to classify different, to basically take our data and put it into different buckets, to kind of put it in different categories, rather than trying to give us a specific answer as to what the learning process has detected. So mainly with, particularly in the IB with OCR, we are gonna be focusing on supervised learning because that's just um, the artificial neural networks that involve backpropagation. But we have other algorithms and other artificial neural networks that don't work that way. And so just focus on taking an image or a piece of data and just trying to break it into different groups or trying to classify it to some art into some arbitrary category for which there's no known label yet. It's something where we'd have to look at all the images that have been put, that have been put in each bucket to be able to understand like how they're actually different. We'll talk more about this in our next section. Now, finally, once we have actually gone through and we have trained our neural network and we've done the whole training process, we do need to address evaluation and refinement. So when we actually test our neural network after we've trained it, we're going to evaluate the model on a separate set of handwriting samples, often known as actually a test data set, to verify the, the accuracy and ability uh, to generalize of our neural network. Now, we might also do things to optimize our neural network, which involves changing the architecture, maybe the number of neurons in each layer, or, um, or the learning rate, and we don't necessarily need to know what the learning rate is, but you need to know that the learning rate and other hyperparameters, which is another term, are basically like mathematical factors in our neural network. So what this is really just saying is that there are some settings that we might need to change within our neural network. So I don't want to go too much into what hyperparameters are again, or learning rate, just know that there's some mathematical variables that are used to control the operations of our neural networks. And those might need to be changed in order to optimize the operations and the accuracy of our network. Now let's take a look at a few IB exam questions in order to better understand how neural networks work and actually look at some different contexts. So we're actually gonna look at a predictive test, text example right here, where the computer predicts the next word in a sentence. And this is gonna be done using a neural network. So identify two features that would be required by an artificial neural network to predict the next word in a sentence. Now, we, we did, if we were you doing text, we need a dictionary of words because obviously we need to know the possible words we can make use of. 
predictive text algorithms, so algorithms that probably have some understanding of grammar and linguistics. Um, the ability to recall previous words in a sentence or memory. So to, have, to be able to keep track of whatever words are in that sentence in order to be able to kind of detect the context. Um, an understanding of language structure, which kind of goes along with predictive text algorithms. And I mean, I think this is kind of the same as this right here. I mean, really, this is a two point question, so we need any two of these. But I think the bottom line is we need to have like some body of like some corpus and dictionary of words. We need to have some algorithms that have an understanding of linguistic structure and grammar. We also need to, be, need to be able to keep track of what uh, words are in the sentence or phrase that's being put into the neural network for which we want to find the next logical word. Now next, the sentence the child is feeling is entered into an application that uses predictive text and three options are suggested. Better, like, a. Uh. Upon entering the two characters, ha, huh, the word hungry is suggested. Explain how the application uses a neural network to suggest suitable words. So again, this is more of a neural network application that doesn't involve image recognition. I mean, there are many questions like that, but I actually included this just so we could see another context that might come up as well. And this context is probably less complex than image recognition, which is why I didn't spend as much time on this as I did on, on image recognition. So, okay, how explain how the application uses a neural network to suggest suitable words. So we have six possible um, points. So we'd input previous words, uh, input the new characters that are entered. We'd have hidden layers. We'd have weights in the network. Um, we'd want to combine our previous words uh, with our new characters. So those are going to be kind of actually like separate outputs that we put together. Um, we're, so we're combining the two inputs, which is going to be done right here. And that's something we haven't seen yet before, where we kind of have two separate sets of inputs that are being combined into a neural network. We have nonlinear regression or sigmoid function. And this is actually going to be an activation function being used. Um, merging layers to produce output. So that's something that is like, I, I mean, I guess merging layers to produce output. I can't even really think of what that means besides the fact like, like if you look at this diagram right here, we have some hidden layers. And I guess this is a, this is like a merge. And, but the thing is, this is just basically going to be an output layer. So, that one is, I'm not really sure what that means. But the last point, back propagation, just training. Um, these are all things that you should know from our previous discussions on neural networks. But I think the one, the one reason I chose this is because I want to highlight this aspect right here, where we have two sets of inputs. Everything else I think is probably the same. Uh, we have input neurons right here. We have our hidden layers and everything that goes with those, including our activation function. Uh, we have our output layer, and then we're conducting training or backpropagation. And I guess that's part of the training process. The training process isn't necessarily mentioned here, but it's something we would need to do in order to utilize neural networks. Now, that being said, let's move on to supervised and unsupervised learning. Now, this particular section is something we touched on in a previous slide. We were talking about how we could use supervised and unsupervised learning both for predictive text and in the context of neural networks, or rather image recognition. So take a, let's take a closer look at what supervised and unsupervised learning both are and what are the differences and similarities between them. So according to the IB, supervised learning is when the output related to a given input is already known. So a neural network can recognize objects and name them based on labels already given and learned. It's an example, I mean, that's an example right here of supervised learning. So basically everything we learned about neural networks, like the whole back propagation process, and the idea of putting in training data first with labels um, to train a neural network, to train a machine learning model um, before actually using it to make a prediction, that's all supervised learning. When we train an algorithm with data for which the expected output is already known, that is supervised learning. So again, here we have input data. These might be images. And each one of those images has a label like dog, cat, dolphin, whatever. We put that into our machine learning model, which in this case would be our neural network. And we're going to train it using that data. However, once we've done the training, we can put in our unseen image, an image that the model has never seen, and use it to make a prediction, which is like, this is a cat or something like that. And it can make the prediction based on the training that it's already gone through from this training data right here. Now, 
I'm just going to go through the process of supervised learning. Again, this is going to be kind of a repeat of what we did with neural networks, but it is the IV response. So I do want to make sure you understand exactly how it works. So we're using a training data set of input data with known response values. We're comparing the output, the model's output with the actual values from the past. Um, and this will give an error. And this is the this is done using the cost function, right? We're basically generating some difference in order to allow us to minimize error. The model is then changed in order to minimize this error using the gradient descent function. Um, in the case of a neural network, like this supervised learning process doesn't exactly have doesn't have to be a neural network, but we've already seen that, so I'm kind of addressing it in that context. Um, but we're going to change the model, which in the case of a neural network would be the weights. And then we put more data into it. We go through that training process enough times until our model is sufficiently accurate. And once that's done, we can use it to make predictions on unseen data. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages to supervised learning. So the advantages are that it's relatively, it's pretty accurate. Like we can get a pretty good result from it. Um, it's easy to understand. So supervised models of which, for example, linear regression is one, are often easy to understand and troubleshoot. Now, linear regression is probably something you've used, if you've used in Excel. It's a thing where you have different data points and you basically draw a line between them and generate a function. That's an example of supervised learning. Um, they're also pretty clear objectives. So we're looking for, we're putting in certain labels and we're looking for one of those labels as output. It just kind of all makes sense to us. There are some disadvantages. We need a large amount of label data. And for example, if we have a bunch of images of different letters of text, all of those may not have labels, but we need to label them. Um, they can only be applied to problems where the output categories or results are known beforehand. So we can apply this to problems or data sets where we don't know what the expected output is in a variety of given scenarios. Next, this like the success of supervised learning depends on the quality of the data. Poor data can lead to poor model performance. And that's kind of true across the board uh, for any type of supervised learning and a lot of machine learning in general. And the next type of machine learning we need to learn about is unsupervised learning. Now with unsupervised learning, we don't know what the, like we don't have any expected outcomes. We don't have any data that we can use to train our algorithm because we don't have any data for which we already know the output. The machine learning algorithm is going to deduce its own solution through classification. So let's say for example, we have a bunch of images of vegetables and we're gonna use unsupervised learning on this to try to find different vegetables. What an unsupervised learning algorithm would do is it would just basically, it would act as like sort of a sorting machine and it would just take all of this data and place it into different categories, into different buckets. That would look something like this. Now there wouldn't be any label, so the algorithm isn't gonna tell us like what each, uh, what each bucket or category is. That's something we'd have to deduce for ourselves by looking at the output. But it's basically just gonna like analyze data and find sort of common clusters, find commonalities between uh, certain pieces of data, and then separate the data based on those pieces of data that have something in common. Again, it's more like a sorting machine. Another example, we might have some points, unsupervised learning algorithm, and we basically get a cluster, we get a group of different types of points. It doesn't tell us like what those groups indicate, but just that those all have something in common. Now, unsupervised learning also has some advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages are it's great at discovering hidden patterns. So it can identify hidden structures and hidden structures and patterns in data that we may not have even thought to look for. And it can kind of just do this on its own and perhaps group certain data points based on their adherence to those structures. We don't need any label data. We're not really outputting a label, so we don't need any label data. And it's it's pretty exploratory. Like we like we can literally just throw some data into it and it can tell us stuff. It can find patterns that we didn't even think of. However, some of the disadvantages are that it's kind of less accurate because we don't have a set of known outcomes. It kind of just like spits stuff out oftentimes and it's up to us to interpret like what that means in, the, in terms of like being a prediction. The algorithms are often more complex to understand and they're not as straightforward as supervised learning algorithms. And there's a lack of objective evaluation criteria. Now, if we put data through a, uh, a supervised learning algorithm, then we're expecting to get some output. And when it doesn't get that output that we expect, we know that there is some kind of error. 
So we can very easily evaluate the performance of a model. If it doesn't give us our expected output, then it's wrong. But with unsupervised learning, because there's no like there's no like concrete output, it's just kind of classifying stuff. There's not really a good criteria in which to evaluate its success. I suppose one criteria could be how well like everything in a particular category relates to each other. But it's also going to be more. It's going to require more complex analysis than with supervised learning. Okay, so now let's take a look at an IB question that applies these concepts of supervised and unsupervised learning. Many toy companies are considering the use of machine learning using either supervised or unsupervised learning. And one particular company, Mags, has recently developed a doll called Alicia. And this allows children to interact with it. So I guess this is either a, a doll called Alicia or I don't know. I don't know why it's in italics. It's weird. Anyways, I guess the doll uses machine learning to ensure the child can have the best possible communication with the doll. Explain why machine learning capabilities may lead to instances when the child and the doll cannot communicate effectively. So one thing to keep in mind is they haven't actually told us like with clarity how machine learning is going to be applied. It's being applied in some way for communication, presumably voice-based communication. So let's look at how the child and doll might, or why the child and doll may not be able to communicate effectively. So first, the language of the child may not have been programmed to the, to the doll. So potentially the doll has been trained to speak, I don't know, Russian, and the child may speak Chinese. So that's one barrier that could lead to them not being able to communicate. Um, the child may not speak clearly. So the child may speak in a way um, that the doll hasn't been trained on or just may not speak clearly, and this may impede communication. Um, the child's language may not be sufficiently developed. So perhaps the child may have to, I mean, it may be if the child is speaking to the doll in a language they're not familiar with, may not just be speaking well um, or syntactically correctly. So the doll may not understand the child and be able to communicate. Additionally, the child just may be really young and may not speak like grammatically correctly yet. So the, the doll just doesn't understand and can't communicate with the child. Also, the child may refer to something not in Alicia's recorded content. So one thing that you might remember from some of the previous examples of predicted text is oftentimes we're gonna need some sort of dictionary um, or some sort of body of textual or uh, linguistic knowledge for a language that is used in order to communicate. And this sort of dictionary may not, like the words the child uses may not be in the dictionary. It may be like something that's very colloquial or just something that the doll hasn't learned or been trained on. And so those are some barriers to um, it, the child and doll communicating when the, child, when the doll has been trained using machine learning capabilities. Again, this is a difficult question because they're not really specific on like what that training consists of or, you know, really what like they just, they just don't really tell you much, but that it was the answer. And next is companies such as Max are considering products that use unsupervised learning rather than supervised learning. Explain the benefits of unsupervised learning in developing products such as a dog called Alicia. Now we'll take a look at what the Mark scheme says and then I'll, I'll kind of try to give a bit more insight into what it means. So. Basically, like what there's six points, but what all of these are hinting at is really the first point. Um, unsupervised learning can be used for bridging the causal gap between input and output observations. So basically, with unsupervised learning, you can you're going to be taking in lots of input, and there may not necessarily be like for input data, there might not necessarily be a clear uh, output or label that can be derived. So between like between let's say for example that a, a doll is going to be speaking to a child right so when the doll speaks to the child um it may not like there may not necessarily be like a a clear output that that doll can be trained on i mean really like this is really getting in a situation in which the doll needs to kind of figure out for itself what to do so particularly when the doll is in new situations that it hasn't been trained on, it still needs to be able to react. And this is where unsupervised learning can provide a benefit. So especially in situations where the doll hasn't really, like hasn't, like the doll has to react to words that doesn't understand or to syntax doesn't understand, we could use unsupervised learning instead in order to bridge this gap, to allow the, uh, the doll to kind of adapt by itself to whatever is going on or whatever situation it's in. So it's really gonna be building a machine learning model upwards from observations, instead of just trying to link whatever input to some predetermined output. 
And again, this can be really valuable because with unsupervised learning, that doll can be adaptive as opposed to just reactive to something it's already seen before. And that's where unsupervised learning can be pretty useful right here. Now this is just a quick meme. Um, supervised, so three main types of machine learning algorithms, and they've all been given a test. So supervised says they gave me so much to read and tests. So they had a lot of information and they knew the expected output unsupervised. Me too, but at least they told you the answers. So they didn't, the unsurprised algorithm doesn't really know what, what the expected output is and just kind of has to react. Um, we don't really need to know about reinforcement learning, but I just thought this was kind of a useful way to illustrate how things work and also add another dimension to what unsupervised learning is. Now let's take a look at another question. A parasite is destroying olive trees in a region in Southern Europe. This area is monitored by taking aerial images at midday each day. A neural network is then used in the analysis of these images. Explain why or outline why neural networks need to be trained before they can be used in this analysis. So ideally in this analysis, what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify certain features in digital images that correspond to parasites destroying olive trees. But like we don't know what features to look for. The neural network doesn't know what features to focus on and look for in these images until it's actually been trained in those. And that's the reason why the neural network needs to be trained first. It just doesn't know what to look for otherwise. Now the second part of this, explain why supervised learning may be preferred to unsupervised learning for training these networks to make predictions on the process, progress of this parasitic disease. So we can go ahead and take a look at the MARSH scheme. Um, and, and the big difference with supervised learning, the process of the image is guided by the output data set. So we can basically tell the machine learning algorithm exactly what types of features to look for. However, if you use unsupervised learning, it's going to output something like some features but it may not necessarily be features that correspond to figuring out where parasites have infected trees and done damage to them. So supervised learning allows us to focus on one specific task and look for a specific set of features, versus unsupervised learning will kind of just do, is do its own thing and may not necessarily give us the output that we want. Now the next concept we're going to look at, and really the last concept, is going to be cluster analysis. So cluster analysis is a means of unsupervised learning, and we kind of saw something like this, but allows us to group certain objects into their own specific groups based on certain characteristics. The goal is to discover natural groupings within data and to identify patterns and structures. And right here, we have some groups. So we have a graph, an XY graph, with height on the Y axis and width on the X axis. And we can identify groups with certain characteristics. And Basically what would happen is we would input these characteristics into a machine learning, uh, into a cluster analysis algorithm. And we come up with these groups. We're, we should come up with these groups of, um, of different people that share, or different, yeah, different people that share like roughly similar characteristics. Okay, now to finish out, let's take a look at a question related to cluster analysis. An image processing system analyzes color images of architectural landscapes. The system compares any new images with existing ones stored in a knowledge base. The purpose of the system is to extend the knowledge base with images of the same scenes taken either from different perspectives or different times of the year or different weather conditions. Explain how cluster analysis can be used to achieve the aims of the system that's described above. So basically what we're what's going on here is we're taking new images and we want to store images of the same scene, but taken from different perspectives or different times of the year or different weather conditions together. So you basically want the same scene, but we want that scene in for like looking slightly different based on the time, conditions, etc. So how can we use cluster analysis to do this? Well, with cluster analysis, we can group together images based on certain characteristics. Um, so what we could basically do is we could put all of those, we could take whatever is our knowledge base and then we can put our new images in there. And then if we use cluster analysis, then we would be able to kind of see, we'd be able to take all the, all the new images and group them together with the old images based on scenes. So, I mean, I guess we could probably do this every time we add new images, um, just because then we wouldn't have to go physically like look through and put those images together. We just be able to apply an algorithm to all images, including the new images, and then they would just the new images would be clustered together with other images that are of the same scene. And that's basically how we could use cluster analysis. Uh, cluster analysis would 
look at different characteristics of that scene, including lines, windows, edges, or anything like that, and kind of group them together. Um, this like this march seems a bit weird because I kind of feel like all three of these say the same thing, and yet this is worth four points. Um, this is maybe the only difference, but I guess it's just kind of a sign that you should probably just repeat yourself. Anyways, that brings us to our next section, which is natural language processing. So what is natural language processing? It's basically a field of artificial intelligence that focuses on understanding, interpreting, and generating human language. It works by using uh, machine learning algorithms that employ statistical and deep learning models in order to interpret language. And oftentimes these, oftentimes these machine learning algorithms or these methods of processing language employ linguistic rule-based algorithms. So they basically employ algorithms that can break down language into its components and understand how to manipulate it and work with language. We used NLP for a variety of tasks. Probably the most common type of task that you've come across has been voice recognition or something like Google Translate. But there are a variety of applications, including translation services, sentiment analysis, or, or analyzing the mood of a speaker, uh, customer service, and information extraction. So basically just getting some information from either textual or voice-based language or language in really any medium. So right here we have a little graph. Uh, and we can say that NLP falls at the intersection of computer science and linguistics. So why is NLP a difficult problem? So the first reason is the inconsistent application of syntax. So every language has some, side of, some kind of syntax. And while there are exceptions to the syntax, generally those, accepta those uh, exceptions are well documented. And this is true for any language that has, let's say, more than 100,000 speakers, right? Like, for example, I have been learning Russian for a long time, and Russian has a lot of exceptions to grammar rules, but those are all pretty well documented, and you can find those in any textbook. However, when people speak, they often break the rules of their language. People don't follow the, the rules of the language in which they're speaking, and this can make NLP a, diff a difficult problem, because when an algorithm has to process someone speaking, but that person doesn't follow like the rules of the language they're speaking, then it runs into problems. Also, the meaning of sentences or words are context dependent. So oftentimes we could say the same sentence in two different ways or in two different situations, and it might mean something completely different. And natural, lang natural language processing has to be able to deal with this. And this kind of brings me to the mul multiple meanings of words. So oftentimes, you know, many words have to have multiple meanings. For example, the word gate could mean the gate to like the gate to enter a, um, a property or it could mean a gate in an airport. And NLP, so natural language processing algorithms, need to be able to distinguish uh, between both of them and be able to understand which meaning is being used in a given sentence or in a given string of text. And this is a difficult thing to do. So computers are good at a few things. They're good at learning the rules or the syntax of a language, learning vocabulary, especially vocabulary that's not heavily textual and learning the meaning or usage of structure, vocabulary, or phrases that are frequently repeated. So basically computers can approach language from a mathematical standpoint. Now to kind of get, to kind of like just really deep in, deep take a deep dive into how natural language processing is viewed and addressed in the IB exam, let's take a look at a practice question. A researcher uses online methods, including emails, to get opinions from academics on the future advances in technology. Over 600 posts are subjected to text analysis using NLP to summarize the opinions. Supervised learning is used to train a neural network to analyze the data. So basically, we want a neural network that's going to take that's going to take some text as input and then output the sentiment or output perhaps the I guess whether their opinion is positive or negative or something like that. It's not exactly clear what the output is going to be, but it's their opinion. So suggest for the scenario a method of developing a fitness function before submitting all the data to the NLP. So if you actually remember, uh, a fitness function is also referred to as a cost function. And this allows us to measure the difference between the error um, of the output from a neural network and the expected output during training. So a fitness function is going to be something that allows us to uh, kind of address that difference between uh, what type of opinion has been output and what the reality actually is based on some training data. So let's go ahead and look at what the answer is to this question. So what we could do is manually analyze a small section or sample opinions, uh, design or define, decide or define the required outcomes, 
and then put them through the neural network and construct a fitness function based on this data. So constructing a fitness function is like, again, it's kind of difficult to define it in the scenario because we don't have a lot of details, but I would just imagine that basically what we would want to do is we want to be able to have a function that allows us to measure the difference between the required outcome and what's actually been put out of the neural network. And I guess what this is getting at is that we don't really have training data. So we would actually have to take some of those opinions and then figure, figure out like what the outcomes are before we could ever see whether there was any error or anything like that. And that's what these two points address. Now there's another question right here, which is a six point question. Explain how this fitness function can be used with a neural network to analyze the complete data. Um, I'm not gonna go into this. It's, I mean, this is basically just going over what a neural network is. But basically you would have to draw a neural network and then you would address what a fitness function is. Um, so you would talk about how it's the difference between the, the output of the neural network and the error and the training process and how that'd be used with back propagation to adjust the weights in the neural network and allow us to ultimately get a predicted output that is closer to reality, that's closer to the actual truth based on our training data. Now we talked a little bit about what computers are good at and why NLP is a difficult problem. Let's, let's kind of dig deeper into this this sort of understanding of how computers process language by comparing human learning and machine learning of languages specifically. So human learning involves complex cognitive processes that are often nonlinear, meaning that they don't necessarily follow specific rules in every situation. They're a bit more like unsupervised learning if you think about it. Versus machine learning follows preset rules and algorithms. Like it's always gonna follow rules. It's not gonna do anything at random the same way that, human that humans do. Humans also utilize past experiences and contextual clues like facial expressions to interpret language. And this is something that machine learning often doesn't have access to. Like, I guess you could argue that if a machine learning algorithm had, had a, like, could get data from a live camera feed, then it could kind of combine that with this, with this understanding of language to understand context. But for the most part, machine learning algorithms by themselves, they employ programming and don't have access to the type of clues that humans have when trying to interpret language. And because of the human, because of humans' ability to do this, they can interpret language in nuanced ways using non-verbal cues and can take ambiguity into consideration, which is something that, that machines can't do. Instead, machines use or statistical probabilities to place words and phrases correctly and discern meaning. So they might have you know, a list of phrases with some um, with some tags with, on them that say what those phrases mean. And then when a machine actually encounters something that resembles that phrase or some language, it'll use statistics to discern which phrase matches up to and whether, and it'll also use statistics to kind of guess what the meaning of that new phrase uh, is based on these other phrases that it's seen in the past. And this is particularly true for words or phrases, phrases that have multiple meanings. So machines use uh, statistics and Humans use nonverbal cues, and they basically use a variety of other types of information that machines don't really have access to, which kind of links to our second point right here. Um, furthermore, with human learning, with human learning of languages and processing languages, we can say the learning process is adaptable, and obviously most humans are capable of understanding language in the same way. Versus machine learning, like there are different learning approaches that machines have. And there are also different just ways that humans approach languages. And this can make it difficult for machines to interpret languages exactly like humans do. I mean, humans inherently have different approaches to language in general. And so when it comes to machines being able to understand and interpret language, they'll run into a lot of roadblocks just because of how different uh, their methodology is from human beings. Now, probably some of the most common tools you've interacted with that make use of NLP are machine translators like Google Translate. So with machine translators, um, we have a few, well, there are a few aspects of machine translators to address. Um, so first of all, machine translators are basically translation tools. So they're computer programs that translate text or speech from, from one language to another. And these, if you ever use these like 10 years ago, then they were not so great. They've gotten better over the years, but oftentimes they can still run into some barriers. 
Now, machine translators often use algorithms and computational processes to interpret the source language and generate translations in the target language. And again, this is more of a recent thing, but nowadays more like I would probably say all machine translators operate on statistical or neural network models. And these neural networks are trained on a large body of language. And we're not just talking about vocabulary, we're talking about phrases, sentences, and possibly even uh, paragraphs that are necessary to encompass a given context. So we kind of started out with just really simple tools that would just take some language and then based, and then it would just use a very simple algorithm to be able to generate the equivalent uh, translation in another language. And we kind of moved on to using highly sophisticated statistical and neural network or generally machine learning based models in order to complete these translations. And to take an even closer look at the evolution of modern machine translators, um, as I just said, and this is kind of a review of what I just said, but um, early machine translators, again, they employed very simple algorithms that relied on simple vocabulary and rule based grammar. And they struggled with context initially. I think there's still a struggle with context because now I'm learning Ukrainian, for example, and I try to like translate certain phrases. And oftentimes they won't necessarily give me the right meaning or a meaning that makes sense just because uh, some verbs and certain phrases are just so contextual. So that was the way that basically translators were initially. They were able to like translate simple vocabulary and grammar, but they couldn't really take context into consideration. Um, but advancements in technology, including memory and processing speeds, allowed for a more data-driven approach, with data being the key to being able to utilize machine learning models or any, any like neural network-based models. Moreover, nowadays, machine translators have access to more extensive databases of multiple languages and statistical techniques to compare meanings, especially when we have words with multiple meanings, and give us a more accurate translation. So we have, we have a major distinction between the direct translation system which is going straight from like vocabulary and rule-based grammar to, um, to your translation, to more statistically oriented methods nowadays that can take uh, that can take context into account, but require more memory, processing speed, and potentially storage. Um, but can give us can kind of take context into account and give us a more sophisticated translation. Now, some of the translations of machine trans of trans machine translation reflect the challenges that. Uh, that face NLP, or natural language processing, more broadly. Um, the first is, like, machines struggle with context, especially with things like idioms and subtle nuances of text. And this requires a higher level ability of interpretation. Um, they struggle with flexibility in language rules. Again, I think, like, a language like Hindi is a great example. I know many, many of my viewers are from India, and, like, oftentimes with Hindi, you can, you can, you can like, say a sentence, but the words in that sentence don't necessarily have to be in the same order each time. And oftentimes you might change the order of words in that sentence based on what we mean and what we want to emphasize. And this is something that can be really difficult for machine translators to uh, be able to translate. Um, other aspects of, I mean, so obviously we can generally say that machine translators have a problem with context, but the, a part of context as well is things like tone and register. Uh, register being formal and informal speech and tone just being the way in which people sort of say something. And these are additional complications when it comes to machine translation. Uh, finally, just one really big difficulty is language diversity. Um, there are thousands of languages and dialects worldwide, and being able to translate all of these and really just be able to get a, a body of, even just a body of language that can be used to train a machine learning based translation system is really difficult. Moreover, like. Like for example, like right now I live in Ukraine and I spent quite a bit of time learning Russian and now I'm learning Ukrainian. But what people here do a lot is they often mix both languages in random ways at times. And if you go closer to the border, for example, with Hungary or, or I guess Moldova, they'll take languages from all of the, they'll take words from those languages and kind of mix them together into this like Creole. And that's something that can be really difficult for something like Google Translate to address because of the fact that like, like it just it's just hard to like it can be really difficult for it to just break down a sentence and then have to go through the task of not only detecting what languages are present in that sentence but then accurately translating each of those in their respective language and putting them back together into something that represents meaning so now what i want to do is talk about uh, two different methods or approaches to machine translation 
And the first is the probabilistic, probabilistic approach. And this is one that relies on statistical models to translate text from one language to another. So basically, we'd have a statistical model that is trained in a large collection of bilingual texts, and it learns the probability of a particular word or phrase in one language being an accurate translation of a word or phrase in another language. So it basically uses the prob that probability to decide what the correct translation is going to be. So this is a prediction based largely on data. So it's going to make that translation based on the frequencies of words and phrases observed in the training data. So if we see a particular word or phrase very frequently being a translation for another word or phrase um, in some set of data, then that's going to be that's going to allow us to make a translation if we're following the probabilistic approach. Um, additionally, another aspect besides just using data is an analysis of patterns. So, so algorithms or machine learning systems that use the probabilistic probabilistic approach will analyze patterns in the text data to determine which translations are most likely to correct, rather than using a direct word-for-word -word translation. So as a whole, what you need to remember is that we use probability. We, we try to statistically analyze uh, different phrases and different, uh, our different pieces of text that are given to us. And we try to figure out, based on past data, what is the probability of that phrase being um, equivalent to our target language, being equivalent to another phrase in our target language based on our past data. Now, another approach is the cognitive rule-based approach. So basically what this does is it employs a set of predefined linguistic rules to translate language from, or translate text from one language to another. So it relies on an extensive set of grammatical and syntactic rules, um, and it uses these rules to dictate how words and phrases should be translated from the source language to the target language. And this is going to be very algorithmic. It requires a deep understanding of the structure and rules of both the source and target language, including morphology, syntax, and semantics. Um, now, basically what we do is we break, we break the language into a system of signs or symbols. Um, really, we, we call these tokens, actually. So we break them into different chunks, and then we would analyze them after breaking them up into chunks based on how they follow certain rules. Now, what I'd actually say is that most machine learning systems are generally some combination of the probabilistic approach and the cognitive rule-based approach. And probably one of the drawbacks of the rule-based approach is the fact that this requires you to have a very sophisticated understanding of both the language you're translating from and the language you're translating to. And this can be quite difficult to achieve. On the other hand, this approach can, can at times be more accurate because we're actually following rules we know of rather than just relying on some past data, right? So if we have, if our past data isn't correct, then we could just be making incorrect translations because of the fact that we don't actually understand what the rules of both languages are. We don't understand that that data doesn't follow syntax and therefore those translations may not be valid. So there are obviously, there are obviously pros and cons to both approaches, but I would generally say that most machine translation systems will utilize both of these approaches with the probabilistic approach being enhanced uh, by machine learning algorithms. Now, I wanna finish off by looking at a, an IB question that involves both the probabilistic approach and the cognitive rule-based approach. So Google Translate is an algorithm whose function is to translate text from one language to another. One of the resources that it uses is the body of documents produced by the United Nations, which are routine, routinely translated by humans into various languages. Discuss the reasons why Google Translate takes a probabilistic approach in preference to a cognitive rule-based approach. Okay, so like one thing to take into consideration first is like Google Translate is an order of magnitude more complex than when this exam came out, which is probably like 2014. So it's not just using documents. Like it's using so much more than just documents. Some documents we know that have been translated by humans. Like we're so far beyond a Rosetta Stone. But anyways, so why would Google Translate use a probabilistic approach versus a cognitive rule-based approach? Now, this is a question I want to address because it kind of gets into the pros and cons of both, which is something that I didn't just break down into a chart. So let's take a look at this question. So um, we know a statistical model involves comparing text to be translated against previously stored sets of text pairs. So basically equivalencies between both languages, um, instances where one sentence has been translated into a, one, well, a sentence in one language has been translated into a sentence in another language. And generally, when we're using the probabilistic approach, we're going to have a whole grouping of these. 
Um, so right here we have a, a, like a rehash of what the statistical model is. Um, right here we have a rehash of what the cognitive model is. Um, and we can say the cognitive model would not be successful for two reasons. The first is that coming up with a clear set of rules is le really labor intensive. It's a lot more labor intensive than just getting a bunch of text in both languages or a bunch of translations from one language into another and then just training a neural network on it. Um, additionally, the, like the cognitive model can be ruined by problems of context, double meanings, and non-centered language, which is something that statistical models can address more effectively because of the fact that they're not really trying to follow any rules. They're just looking at like what translations are in real life. So they're just looking at instances of translations rather than trying to come up with some like generalizable rules, which, I mean, there's not always general, generalizable rules for language. We could say the first approach was taken, meaning the statistical model, because the company has stored an enormous set of validated texts in different languages, and the increase in processing power allows this corpus, corpus is meaning like a collection of language, to be searched and processed. So we have a bunch of, we have a body of text, we have a huge amount of translated text uh, between both languages or two languages or many languages. And now we also have the processing power to deal and to analyze all this text. So it makes more sense to apply the statistical model, which can also to a certain extent take things like context and double meaning into account. Now, the last aspect of this topic I wanna to address is chatbots and machine learning. Like for some reason, the curriculum makes up chatbots to be like a huge, a huge part of machine learning, but really like most chatbot related questions are related to natural language processing or related to other aspects of this curriculum, which we've already gone over. So basically chatbots are like, are bots that give you, so they're basically like when you open up a chat window in your browser, and you type something in and you get an automated response it's not from a human so they evolved from performing simple repetitive tasks to more complex functions like interpreting text and recognizing speech nowadays in things like chat gpt you can also update or upload images and have those be analyzed moreover they started out with being able to give you a limited set of responses um, and now they use machine learning techniques to allow you to give like expert output or to allow you to give more uh, more human type responses. Moreover, modern chatbots chat learn from their users, adapting and refining their responses and capabilities over time to provide more personalized and accurate, accurate assistance. Like probably the most common chatbot is ChatGPT, and that, that employs something called um, large language models. And this is basically a system that continually adapts based on user input in order to provide a not only more personalized responses, but to provide a higher quality of responses overall to those using ChatGPT. And that actually brings us to the end of this video. Um, so one thing that I would like to go over is some of the sources. One source that I did make use of was the computer science wiki. I use it a little bit just to provide some structure because it's like the only thing that I found on option B on the internet. The only source rather I found. I also use past papers extensively and chat GPT. Now to give you some chat updates, by this point in time, I've already released the uh, SL uh, video. But the next video I'm probably gonna make is a video comparing all four options because at least on the Discord, that's the question I've gotten the most often. And then I'm continuing to build out uh, my A-level curriculum, which again, is maybe not relevant to you, but I always like to tell my viewers like the overall direction of the channel. Anyways, if you found this, val if you found this video to be of value, please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Have a nice day.